Corners computer. Okay, you can go. Okay, uh, so thank you again for letting me pre present a little bit about my research tonight. Um, I think I did give a talk, I'm not sure if it was at this, um, um, this society or center. I did give a talk three years ago, so I hope it's not too much of a repetition. Um, but please also uh, interrupt me at any time if you want questions. You don't have to wait until the end of the presentation. Okay, so I think, I mean, everyone knows what asteroids are, so I don't want to go into too much detail what exactly an asteroid is. Um, the, the answer to that question is not quite as black and white as you might think. Um, but I'd like to show this slide of um, just sort of a, a cross section of the solar system looking from the side on. And there are a lot of things on the outer solar system and the, uh, even further out that sort of um, match the description of an asteroid. And I don't want to go into too much detail are there asteroids or are there not? But the stuff I'm going to be talking about today is more the stuff that we find sort of between the transition of the inner solar system and the outer solar system. So you get the main belt, of course, here, which is Ceres is the largest object there. And then there are some objects that get flung out of, of, out of the main belt um, into the inner solar system. And if they have Earth crossing or orbits similar to Earth, the Earth, then they become near Earth asteroids. And so it's the, this inner solar system objects that I'm going to focus on tonight. But just wanted to make you aware that there are things out there in the solar system that sort of also um, um, can describe by um, what we say in inverted commas um, asteroids so things that are not planets out there um, this is just another uh, view of the inner solar system um, so the, the the four inner planets uh, mercury venus earth and mars orbits are shown here and um, what you see here in, in white dots are are actually known um, asteroids. Um, so these are main belt asteroids that have been discovered and we know about them. And you can see the main belt forming nicely in this image and you can see Jupiter's orbit just in the corner over here. Um, and so I, in the past, I've done a lot of research on or uh, characterization of main belt asteroids, um, but it's the near Earth asteroids that I'm going to focus a little bit more about in this talk. And these are the ones that you see colored uh, sort of red, uh, green, uh, and blue. And they essentially originated in the main belt, and they just got flung into the inner solar system through um, gravitational perturbation by the larger planets. And then they get flung into the inner solar system and can become near-Earth asteroids. OK, so how do we um, know about these near-Earth asteroids, or asteroids in general? Um, Asteroids have been discovered for hundreds of years. Um, I think the first asteroid, Sirius, the largest one um, in the main belt, was discovered more than 200 years ago by an Italian astronomer. And in the past, um, they basically were discovered serendipitously. Astronomers were looking at the sky either through a telescope or through actual images. And if they see anything moving relative to the background stars, then that is a potential asteroid. And it's only sort of in the mid 90s um, that they were dedicated um, programs just found it to and their sole purpose is to find asteroids and I, I show a few in the top here Catalina and Pam stars are sort of the the big guys at the moment and Atlas is sort of the the new kid on the block um, there's also been some some space space based telescopes looking for asteroids um, and they function typically different to I guess a conventional telescope in the sense that they do these sort of surveys all they do is they just take images of their an entire night sky or visible sky. Typically, they take a couple of images at the same place, what we call a footprint. And so, for instance, this is an example of Atlas, and you can see sort of a dark block here indicates one image has been taken, slightly darker, second image, and if it's sort of this white color, then, for instance, four images have taken. And then they have very sophisticated software that um, um, analyzes these images and pulls out any little thumbnails. So this is not one of these blocks, this is a very tiny little thumbnail, it would be like one pixel um, on this image of one of these blocks where it's, it's picked up something that's moving relative to the background star. And then it flags that as a potential asteroid, checks this with the Minor Planet Center, if it's a known one, um, if it's a known one, they just add that to the, uh, to the catalog of observations of that known asteroid. If it's not, it gets um, a new designation and eventually becomes a new discovery. Um, so Catalyst, the new kid on the block, I want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, and so Atlas is, um, stands for um, Asteroid Terrestrial Impact Lost Alert System. Um, and up until last year, it consisted of two telescopes, uh, both located in, on two different islands in Hawaii. 
And so it's designed and operated by the group of Professor John Tonray and Dr. Larry Denal um, at the University of Hawaii. Um, and so they've, they designed the system, they operate uh, well, all four telescopes, I'll get to them soon, but the two that are in Hawaii and um, this is a little bit of details for the telescope. It's, it's fairly modest size, so um, only half a meter um, in diameter mirror. So fairly smaller than some of the other surveys out there. But where it lacks in size, it, lack, uh, it gains in field of view, so massive field of view. So this is the actual field of view, uh, five by five degrees on the sky. Um, and also it's quick and nimble, so it sort of does this like rapid scanning of the entire sky trying to look for, for, for asteroids. Some stats here, since the programs come online, discovered almost 800 near-Earth asteroids, of which almost 100 now are potentially hazardous ones. Some comets have been discovered. And then, um, of course, because they um, are designed to look for anything changing, um, typically things that are moving, um, but they also do see, you know, just stars appearing or getting brighter. So they've discovered a bunch of other transits like supernova. Um, and so the reason why I want to talk about Atlas is because, so the exciting news is in, um, so Atlas started in 2017 and around about 2018, when they showed, you know, the system works, they'd applied for funding to, to build two more of these telescopes. Um, and the first thing they wanted to do is not build another two of them in Hawaii. They wanted to build them somewhere else in the world for two reasons. Um, you want to cover the North and the South. Um, so if I go back, um, you can see, okay, so this is a little bit deceiving, but for instance, this is as far South as they can go in Hawaii. So they can't really, look at the, the southern cap. That's one reason why you want to build telescopes in the southern hemisphere. The other reason is that you want to go in a different time zone. So you want to be able to basically monitor for potentially hazardous asteroids 24-7. So when it's nighttime there, um, or daytime in Hawaii, you want it to be nighttime somewhere else at one of your telescopes that you're observing 24-7. And so there were a couple of sites, obviously, that matched that criteria. Um, but South Africa, perfectly matches that criteria because it's pretty much antipodal to Hawaii. Um, it's it's uh, both exactly 12 hour time difference and it's, it's basically as far south as Hawaii is north from the equator. And so in 2018, uh, so they finally got funding and in 2018, uh, Larry, which is this guy over here, and John, who are the PIs of Atlas, came to South Africa to, to look at the site and sort of picked the site there in Sutherland. So if you've ever been to Sutherland, you might recognize some. This is the ACT telescope, uh, Alan Cousins telescope. Um, this guy you might recognize. I think this has got some Amanus connection. This is his DS, is it DS, DLR, DSR, German telescope. But I've seen that there's a um, Amanus uh, space agency sign here. So I think there is some connection there. Um, yeah, so they picked this site over here. Um, that was in 2018 and 20 to, was it 2021? I um, mean, uh, 2019, this container arrived. Um, and inside this container was um, the ash dome. So many of the, the domes actually in Sutherland are ash domes. For instance, these are the LCO telescopes. They're all ash domes. This is the RSF that's also an ash dome. So there's several ash domes. They're sort of the go-to uh, dome manufacturers in the US. Um, and these domes come sort of in a, in a kit, kit style. So um, this container arrived with all the components for the dome and also a bunch of timber, so the Americans would say, and a little booklet um, giving you instructions on how to assemble this. And so Ash would have, was supposed to fly out and help construct this telescope or the dome in the building, but because of COVID, they, they couldn't travel. And so myself and uh, Billy Quirtz, some of you might recognize this name, um, the famous Billy. Um, he, um, him and myself, we decided, okay, well, let's give this a go and we're going to try and put this dome together ourselves, obviously with some help with some of the local Sutherland staff. Yeah, and so we went there and um, so the pad was first constructed by a, a construction company in March. And so in November that year, when the pad was, the cement pad was there and the container was there, we went up for two weeks and, you know, so we put this, this um, dome building together and these are the few videos that I want to show. Just um, so Billy's got a bunch of YouTube videos um, on this construction. So please go visit his YouTube um, channel to see the other videos. But these are just some um, um, clips that I took off. So this is just us building some of the walls. This was us um, with some of the staff mm -hmm. members putting the actual dome together. And so these these um, 
these plates slide in in these in these ribs. It's actually quite quite easy to put together. And yeah, two weeks later we had a semi-constructed dome. And I think we went back a week later to just finish a few things off. So yeah, this it, it's a fairly large building. I mean, it's five meters in diameter and uh, you know almost eight meters high. But um, you know, three or four people can, you know, with this timber American style construction, four people can put this building together in three weeks. It's not too difficult. So that was in, like I said, in November 2020, we did that um, that building. And and then sort of the, the big COVID wave struck um, even before this, but sort of then it was deep into COVID and there were a bunch of delays and so the telescope manufacturing delay was almost a year and a half, and that actually only arrived almost um, seven months after we finished. So sort of in September or so, um, the, the telescope and the mount arrived in Sutherland. The mount arrived, the cameras and everything arrived, and in December 2021, um, John and Larry were going to fly out from Hawaii to um, assemble everything. Um, and so they were. They had their plane tickets and everything. And three days before they were due to fly, um, Omicron variant hit, and they basically couldn't. They couldn't leave uh, Hawaii or come to South Africa. And um, yeah, no, that sort of <laughs> uh, threw everything in the air. And we weren't sure. You know, should we should we go ahead? And they, we had a long Zoom chat with them one evening. And Billy and I said, and a bunch of the other ESO staff said, you know, we cleared two weeks to put everything together to help them. Um, why don't we try and do this remotely? So um, myself and Billy and a bunch of SOO staff spent uh, another week and a half or two weeks uh, with, you can see John, I mean, yeah, John in the background here on Zoom, putting everything together. So this, it's a little bit of a cheat. This picture was taken later than December, 2021. It's actually when we <laughs> reinstalled the mirror, but we installed the mirror. This is the filter cassette that I'm populating with uh, very expensive filters. Um, you know, this is the telescope, some more pictures of me putting the camera together. So this was all done completely by Zoom, them giving us step-by-step -step instructions, plug this in there, put the screw in there. So it seems like a, a um, you know, a crazy task, but it actually worked quite well. And um, yeah, on the 13th of December, this was sort of, uh, I think we started on the 5th or so. So a few, uh, almost a week later, we had our first light, sort of. Obviously, the first thing we took was a picture of the LMC. And so this gives you an idea of the massive field of view. So in one single image, the whole entire LMC fits in asteroids um, in Atlas's field of view. So it's, it's got really an impressive field of view. Um, yeah, so first slide, 13 of December. And um, on, it took them, you know, about a month or so to, you know, iron out all the bugs and get the software and stuff going. And on the 22nd of January, 2022, they discovered the first uh, near Earth asteroid. So these are the first discovery images, the, the, the four frames. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, this was asteroid 2022BK. 20, um, and these are just some photos, um, was this March this year? So a couple of months ago, um, you know, just uh, tightening the last few screws and doing a few things. And actually then um, John found a gap in his um, schedule and Omnicron was finished and he actually flew out um, just to come and inspect and you know give the stamp of approval and say we did everything correctly. Yeah, yes, the list of the near Earth asteroids that um, Atlas Sutherland has discovered this year. Um, so it doesn't seem like a lot, you know, it's, it's only like a handful now, but they're still ironing out a few bugs um, and this, this discovery rate of, of Atlas Sutherland should, should ramp up rapidly, especially in the next few weeks, because in the past month or so, we've really done a lot of things to just finally sort out everything in, in the software, for instance, and, and you know tweak the focus and all these type of things. Okay, so that was um, Atlas and Atlas Sutherland specific uh, discovery. Um, and so this slide is just um, sort of giving an overview of what the, the the current state of, of near Earth discoveries is in, in general. So like I said, Atlas is the, the new kid on the block. Um, Catalina, which is shown in green here and, and pan stars and pink are sort of the big boys. Um, and so, so it doesn't look like Atlas is doing a lot of discoveries, but um, each telescope has its, has its little um, niche market in a sense. Um, 
Atlas is, is smaller, much more nimbler. So they're supposed to sort of catch the ones that slip through the fingers of these two, um, these two surveys. Um, and it's doing that actually very well. And yeah, you can also see the, what I was talking about, these discovery programs coming online sort of in the mid nineties. The first was Linear um, and then uh, Catalina and Pan starts took over and then Atlas sort of joined here in two, 2016. And yeah, so also just some of the, the stats, um, almost 30,000 year of asteroids discovered so far. Um, sounds like a lot, but it's actually not a lot compared to um, main belt asteroids. Yeah, we are almost at 1.2 million. Um, and again, you know, uh, we're discovering what's at 6,000 or 7,000 in six months. So, you know, 14,000 um, main belt asteroids we're discovering in a year. So that, that's going up quite a lot. The near Earth asteroids are, we almost had about 3,000, so 1,406 months. So we're going to reach 3,000. So we're probably going to get to about the same here. And so it does actually look like this <clears throat> discovery rate is um, dropping, or not dropping off, but at least leveling out. Um, and that's because we've, we've pretty much discovered all the large near Earth asteroids. Um, and it's, it's really the small ones that we are continually discovering. And the reason why this will never really drop off is because the small ones you can only discover when they come close to you. So we just have, it's not just a question of, observe, of surveying for many decades to, to find all of them, because you have to wait for them to come close to us. Or you have to build really, really big telescopes. Okay, so that was um, discoveries of, of near Earth asteroids. Um, and so, of course, it's important to discover near Earth asteroids because they pose a, a threat because some of them aren't impacting orbits. So it's really important that we know about all of them. But that's not the full story. We, of course, um, Sorry, uh, myself. Can I just ask a question? Yes, go for it. Um, that middle table, it's called uh, minor planets discovered. Yes. 1.2 so, million. Uh, what's the diff what's, what makes it a minor planet versus an asteroid? Yeah, so that's why I said um, that that answer, that, that answer to what is an asteroid and what's an asteroid is not so black and white. Because you get stuff like centaurs, which are sort of asteroids, sort of comet-like. Then you get comets, um, which are not asteroids, they're comets. Then you get trans-Neptunian objects. You get stuff like Pluto, which some people say are, are planets and some people say they're not planets. So what they've done is they've, they've come up with this term minor planet, which basically covers everything um, that's not a planet. So that's, that includes centaurs, comets, asteroids, near-Earth asteroids, main belt asteroids, uh, Jupiter Trojans, everything falls under this minor planet okay. um, category. But this majority of, of minor planets are main belt asteroids. There's just, that's the majority of them. That doesn't necessarily mean that the majority of objects out there are main belt asteroids. It's just they, they're close by. So we've discovered, the, most of the stuff we've discovered are main belt asteroids. So they could be out in the Oort cloud way, way more stuff than in the main belt, we don't know. It's just we, we, we can't see them, they're just too far away. Does that make sense? Thanks. Okay, so that was discovery, but of course, um, what we wanna do uh, know is not just know about the asteroids, where they are and where they might be in the future. We also wanna know a little bit more about them. Um, and that's where the characterization comes in because most people think asteroids are just sort of um, dull pieces of rock and that is true to a sense, um, but they do have subtle differences. Um, and so this, this sort of collage here of asteroids, um, I think perfectly tries and illustrates that because not only is it uh, true to scale, so um, the size here is true to scale, um, the albedo, so how much light the reflective is also try to um, uh, been done correctly here. So you see some, some asteroids really reflect a fair amount of light, say 10, 20, 30% of the light, like the, like the moon, but some asteroids are really dark. Um, they only reflect a few percent of the light that reflects from them, from the sun. Then you get asteroids that are almost round. So I don't have images of Ceres and Vesta here, but they're almost completely round. They look like the moon, uh, very large objects. Um, but the smaller guys can be sort of uh, irregular shaped. Um, so that's a difference, they, 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 their shapes are different, their albedos are different. And then there's another thing is that they, the, their makeup is, is not all the same. They're not all made from the same material. And that's in a sense uh, um, shown up in this albedo difference, but also in um, uh, how they reflect a different color of light. So you see some of the asteroids are sort of this dull 
gray, white, like the moon, but some of them have this subtle sort of uh, reddish orangey tinge. Um, and, and this can give an indication of, of, of what they're made out of. And that's, that's interesting for us as scientists in general, because if we can find correlation between their shapes and their sizes and their makeup relative to where they are in the solar system, that can teach us about how the solar system evolved and how it developed. But it's also important for um, uh, planetary defense. So if we discovered something that's going to hit us tomorrow, the first thing we're going to know is what is it made out of? Is it solid rock or is it sort of um, loosely held together regular um, and um, the color or uh, how the light's reflected from that? So the characteristics of the asteroid might reveal that. So that might be important for, for the smaller, smaller guys as well. Um, <clears throat> and so in the in the past, in the past five or six years, I've been doing this characterization for many, many main belt asteroids. Um, but I, I would like to focus on doing more characterization of near Earth asteroids going forward, um, and specifically small near Earth asteroids, because we know a fair amount about the, the composition distribution of main belt asteroids and some of the large uh, uh, near Earth asteroids we've, we've sort of characterized quite a lot. But it's really the small guys um, that we don't really know about, the small population in general. You know, for instance, asteroids below 100 meters in diameter, are they mainly stony type or are they carbonaceous asteroids? No one really knows the answer to that because um, to characterize small asteroids is challenging. And I think the next slide sort of is in a, try to illustrate why that is challenging. So the first so this is one example that I wanted to show. So this example is of an asteroid called 2019 OK. So this was a near-Earth asteroid that made an extremely close approach to Earth on the 25th of July, 2019. So 75 meters in diameter. So, um, you know, the sub-100 meter size that I was talking about. Um, and so what makes, makes characterization of an asteroid like this extremely challenging is what I've plotted on the... So by the way, this is the Earth, this is the asteroids flyby, and this is the moon. So this gives you an indication how close it came to the Earth. Um, and so what makes it difficult to do follow-up characterization of this asteroid or asteroids like these is what I've shown on the right here is the, the V magnitude. So the, the magnitude of this asteroid is a function of time. And so this is uh, MJD, so it's from 80 to 90, the last digit, so this is 10 days. Um, and if you know, much about astronomy, then this magnitude decreasing value means bright, uh, it's getting brighter. Um, and so you can see this asteroid is getting brighter and brighter and brighter as it's going close, uh, coming close to Earth, and then it's suddenly getting very dimmer. Um, and so this 20th, 20, 21st magnitude is sort of the magnitude that these uh, pan stars and Catalina sky surveys, they in principle can see that faint. So they should, should be able to discover this asteroid over here, but for, for instance, in this specific case, it was full moon. So um, most of these surveys sort of avoid the moon by a few degrees. So they weren't pointing where this asteroid was coming from. So they missed it. And even when the full moon was gone for various other reasons, they didn't pick up the asteroid. Coincidentally, Atlas did pick up this asteroid in its images over here, but their software never detected it in the images. So they later on, when it was discovered, they went back in the images and they did see it over here. But the asteroid was actually only discovered at this point here when it reached sort of 15th magnitude. Um, and this was one day before it made its close approach. So this asteroid was only discovered here. So if you wanted to do rapid follow-up characterization, so, you know, jump and observe this asteroid and do multiband photometry or spectroscopy or, or name it, you could only do it after this, this point here. And it started to rapidly fade in, fade in brightness pretty much the day after. So you would have had to jump on this asteroid the same day it was discovered to do follow-up characterization. And so this is an extreme case. This is not, this is really an extreme case, but it's, it's pretty typical of this size asteroid. Um, they usually only discovered a few days before they make their close approach and then fade rapidly. So you have to be quick on the trigger if you wanna do um, follow-up characterization. You have to be sometimes within the same night, but at least um, within a few days. And that's why I was, uh, if you guys were, um, on earlier, um, someone was asking me, do I go to Sutherland often? Um, and um, we were talking about uh, the way that observations were done in the past and how they are moving in the future. And in the future, it's really this, this rapid um, 
uh, response time, which is, is really something that the SOO is going to try and um, become experts in, in, in observing um, not just asteroids, but just general transient stuff um, in, a rapid, in a rapid manner. Um, and so we have many um, telescopes that, that we can do that. So for instance, what I've been using for um, characterization of, of asteroids has been the 40 inch telescope, 74 inch to an extent. Um, but one thing that I wanna sort of finish my presentation on is um, Lacedi. So Lacedi is, is really the, what, what I'm seeing is gonna be the workhorse um, characterization telescope that I'm gonna be using to, uh, for, this, for this NEA stuff. Um, and not only that, it's uh, the telescope with this, this new brand new instrument that we've installed, McCordy. So coincidentally, um, that same time I was installing Atlas in Sutherland in what was that, December last year, we were also installing um, McCordy um, on Lacedi, which is, so McCordy is this um, dual imager and low resolution spectrograph um, that we developed uh, the SRO developed together with the uh, Liverpool John Moore University in the UK. Um, and it's this sister instrument of a very similar instrument on um, uh, the two meter um, Liverpool telescope in the Canary Islands. So the instrument there is called SPRAT. Um, and so McCordy, which means rainbow and Susutu, is, is based on the same instrument. And uh, what it is, it's a dual imager and spectrograph. So you see it's got this uh, off, off the shelf and or camera. Um, over here is the slit for the spectrograph. Here is some um, uh, collimating um, optics. What you see over here is the grating, which does the dispersion. Um, and what you can do is with these uh, pneumatic pistons, you can move everything out the way. So this is not just a, a, a prism or a grating, it's a grism. And what that means is that the the beam is not bent when it's dispersed. It actually carries on in a straight line. And so the beauty there is because everything is linear, there's no bending of the beam. All you do is you just move out these, the, the slit and the grism and uh, yes, the slit and the grism out of the beam. And then um, it, it turns from a spectrograph into an image and you can take nice images. And so you can do imaging. So you can do photometry, do light curves of your target. And when you wanna do spectroscopy, just move these, these things in with pneumatics fully re uh, remotely. You don't have to physically be there. Um, and then it becomes a spectrograph and then you can uh, do spectra of your same target. And so a really nice little instrument. And it's also installed on our, our brand new one meter telescope, Lacedi, which was also designed from the onset to be robotic. So both these instruments, both these, the telescope and the instrument were designed in the, from the onset to be sort of semi-automated robotic telescopes. Um, yeah, and just some pictures here. This was us in November last year doing uh, testing in the lab. Um, this was on the observing floor. So if you've been into the SETI telescope, this is on the floor there uh, doing last few checks. And this is us mounting it on the telescope finally. Uh, yeah, just some images to show the, the power of this instrument. So um, again, it can become an imager. So if you move these things out of the way, you can take semi -wide, pretty wide field um, imaging. So this is 10 arc minutes by 10 arc minutes. Um, oh, so we also have a filter slide. So this filter slide has got the full um, SDSS filters in. So I think this was a composite of GR and I false colored on those on those filters. So just showing the, the, the multi-filter capability. Like I said, uh, image uh, photometry and also a rapid, fairly rapid camera. So you can do fast, in, uh, fast photometry. So to give you an idea, this was um, a light curve of a star that has a very slow um, variability of a couple of hours, but on the slow variability, there's also a very rapid va variability in, in the order of a couple of seconds. I think this is 20 seconds or so. Um, and this was just a comparison with <clears throat> one of our other cameras, Shock, which is a really fast photometer. And just, just to show that this, this um, instrument can, um, the noise is a little bit higher in this uh, on the system, but it, it can match um, similar type of fast photometry, what our sort of work fast, workhorse fast photometry uh, shock can do uh, in Sutherland. So you can take wide field imaging, you can do fast photometry, and then once you want to do some uh, spectroscopy, you move in your grism, in your slit, put the target on the slit, and then you can do um, spectroscopy as well. And so 
this is really what I want to do in the future is um, this is the ultimate atlas that is right next to this telescope. We'll make a, a discovery on the same night. We will um, alert, um, get an alert of the discovery. We will automatically submit um, observations to our OCS um, for this telescope and instrument. It will automatically do the observation. It will take an image of the asteroid, do a light curve uh, so we can get rotation period and um, um, absolute magnitude so we can get the size of the asteroid. Then we will move our slit in and we will do spectra um, and do spectroscopy on the asteroid. We'll get um, the composition and we will basically fully characterize this asteroid within say half an hour or an hour or so after it's discovered. Um, and this is just to illustrate also the ex excellent non-sidereal tracking of the telescope. So of course, um, to do spectra of, of a star, you would just put the star on the slit and, and track sidereally. But um, in order to do um, spectroscopy on an asteroid, you have to do track non-sidereally. Um, and so this is just to show that the non-sidereal tracking of this telescope is good enough. So this looks this is a short clip, but it's um, a stack of exposures taken over the course of 30 minutes. So you do see a slight drift of the asteroid out of the slit, but um, typically we would do five, maybe 10 minute exposures. So within this 30 minutes uh, would be enough to get a spectra of this, of this asteroid. And that's basically it. That's what I want to finish, uh, finish off with. Um, if there are any more questions, you're welcome to ask questions. And there's a special prize for whoever can guess or recognize this asteroid in this image of here. Thank you. Hmm. Any guesses on the prize there, Pierre? Anybody? Come on, this one. Yeah, of course. So this oh, was well, uh, <clears throat> yeah. So this was asteroid and minus. Um, you guys might know my colleague uh, Professor David Trilling. I think he visited minus a couple of years ago, um, yes. and maybe gave a talk. I guess. Um, yeah, and he discovered this asteroid in 2005, and then he decided to name it after Amanus. And um, it's it's fairly faint. I've I've been I've been uh, checking or um, the magnitude for the you know the past five years or so, and it's sort of on the 21, 22 magnitude. But it did get picked up by Atlas um, on the 26th of December, 2019. So this must have been a very good night in Hawaii with excellent seeing because this is about one magnitude fainter than what Atlas was designed to see. So this must have been a really excellent night. And so they got four, four frames of it. So at least, I don't know if it's still there, but on the 26th of September, 2019, I could say that the asteroid was where it was supposed to be. What's the size of it, uh, Mick? Is it one to two kilometers? Uh, this is a main belt asteroid. So I, it's definitely above a kilometer now. Yeah. Give me a sec, I could. Because I think the the tablet at Asteroid Amanus on the solar system, the clip path solar system model says one to two kilometers. Yes, that sounds about right. Yeah. But of course, it's a main belt asteroid, right? It's not the Earth asteroid. So it, it, it never comes close to us. So its magnitude is always going to be about 22, um, 21, 22. Nick, uh, can I ask another question? Um, yes. A lot of the meteorites and so on seem to be, have a very high metal content, seem to be a lot of iron and so on. Is that, is that an unusual sort of content for, for asteroids or what, what's the reason why? Or you know, why a lot of the meteorites we find are actually mostly iron or so. Is there any sort of theory on that? Or? Yeah, so that's just a, that's just a filtering effect. So the, the only the iron ones make it to the surface. Um, okay. So it's, it's very biased to what, what makes it to the surface. So most of the stuff that hits us just burns up in the atmosphere and uh, you don't really find them. So, so what size um, asteroid is likely to not burn up in the atmosphere and, and hit the, if it was to come in, in a straight line for Earth? Again, that, that depends on what it's made out of. If it's um, 
um, if it's got an iron core, it doesn't have to be very big at all. It will, will make it to the surface. If it's carbonaceous, um, um, you know, we're looking, looking at uh, maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 meters, then some of the fragments will make it to the surface. Um, it, it really depends on what it's made out of. So um, to give you an idea that that, that asteroid that hit um, Russia in 2013, I think that was a carbonaceous type asteroid and that was 20 meters in diameter. And I think that they did pick up fragments, um, you know, sort of small pieces, yeah. like the size of your hand. So this sort of, um, I mean, that one that was only spotted the day before it came past was 70 meters, I think you said. So if yeah. something just slightly smaller than that and might be missed and it hit, what's the likely sort of damage? Can it do quite a lot of damage? Yeah, so you don't have to have uh, stuff hitting the surface to cause damage. And that's exactly what we saw with that, that Russian impact. Yeah. The Most of the damage was actually the, 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 the big explosion in the atmosphere. So at some point, this, this asteroid is coming, it's coming six kilometers a second. So the, the pressure, the, the front pressure on the asteroid is so massive that this thing just explodes in the atmosphere. Um, and that, that big explosion can cause a, a massive shock wave. And so that's actually what caused the ma major damage in that particular um, impact so you know uh, window shattering and people standing at the windows um, and stuff like that so you don't actually need something physically hitting the surface to to cause yeah. damage and then the same same one with the Tunguska, Tunguska event in um, in Russia as well in 1901 um, you know all those those pictures you see of the trees being flattened that that's not necessarily something that hit could have again been the, the explosion in the air that the, that shock wave that just flattened all the trees because the crater for that's actually not that impressive it's the, the crater's already sort of eroded away because it's not the crater was probably not caused by something hitting us it was just caused by a shock wave Next, right. the idea that the uh advantage of the Atlas telescopes is their agility or ability to react quickly. Um, yes. Of detail uh, detected uh, compared to Pan Stars and Catalina. Uh, can you repeat that last part? I didn't get that last part. Pierre, can you repeat the question? Uh, Nick didn't hear it properly. Uh, I get the impression that the the competitive advantage, the main advantage of the Pan Stars telescopes, are the quick reaction time. Um, how do they compare in terms of resolution and detail that you get from the observation with Catalina and Pan Stars? Yeah. So the biggest difference is um, I don't have the exact numbers here, but Pan Stars and Catalina are um, I think at least one meter in ap size aperture. So four times the collecting area of Atlas. So they can see much deeper. So they, you know, they are pushing like 21, 22 magnitude. Um, and of course, the, the fainter you can see, the smaller asteroids you can see, and there's a, a, a exponential size distribution. So there are way, way, way more smaller asteroids than bigger ones. So every time you can see a little bit more into the smaller range, the more you will discover automatically so that's why that plot that i showed you um size wise they just they just discover way more than atlas um but like what, what i want to show you this is now for instance atlas the two hawaiian telescopes so the one telescope will sort of cover the the, the northern cap the other one will cover sort of a mid band and then now you have the two southern telescopes that will cover the south so in in one night the four telescopes cover the entire visible sky. So they, they basically, if, if it's there and it's within the, the limiting magnitude, which is 18 and a half, 19, they will, they will pick it up. Um, whereas the Pan Stars and Catalina, they might uh, go deeper, but they will not cover the entire sky every night. They will cover the entire sky every, I don't know, a couple of days. Um, so they will focus on one little section and then do another little section and do another little section. So... They might just be unlucky and the asteroid is in this part of the sky and they were observing there this night so they might miss it um, and so that's why i was saying um atlas is sort of scooping behind and just picking up all the ones that they've missed although they would 
um, they would only see them when they're much closer to us. So, so pan stars might see something further out, like, you know, something that's going to hit us. They might see it like two weeks in advance. Atlas will only see it like uh, a few days in advance. Um, but yeah, everyone has their sort of own little strength and weaknesses. And, and of course, you, um, that, that's why there are so many, um, I mean, a lot of people say, well, why do they have Catalina and Pan Stars and Atlas? I mean, they're all sort of funded by the same, you know, American institutes or whatever. Why do they have many? And it, it, I think what I just explained explains that they each has their little their niche. Thanks. Nick, uh, can I um, think you, you mentioned that uh, I think 30th of June is, is annual asteroid day. Um, yes. I believe there's something important on the 30th of July. Is that a month out of the major activity? Yeah, so <clears throat> that is interesting because um, uh, I don't know if this is what you're referring to. Um, uh, where's this? Okay, so this guy was on the 25th of July, this very close approach. Um, in 2018, there was 2018 LA. Uh, which also in July hit uh, Botswana. Then there was 2019 o OM or something like that, which hit the Caribbean. Um, and all of this seems to happen in July. I think it's completely coincidental. I was just making a joke, I think, last time. Um, but it, it does seem like these, these, these close shaves and these actual hits all happen in July. And, and again, like you, like you said, uh, Asteroid Day, is on the 30th of June, and that was the Tunguska event, which was on that day. So that was also in June, July. So who knows? Maybe there is really a correlation there. Thank Thank you. You. I, have no, I have no idea. I just heard from a, a budding astronomer that he was looking for an asteroid on that date. <laughs> Sorry, Nick, can, can you just tell us a little bit about the tracking system of the, of the asteroid? I mean, we understand Sidereal, I mean, it's just like a glorified clock that rotates at the clock speed of the Earth. But how do you track? How do you track an asteroid so accurately? Um, so once the asteroids, um, uh, could I show? Maybe I could. So so once the asteroids are discovered, um, those four observations. So for instance, these four data points. Um, the astrometry is submitted to the Minor Planet Center. They immediately um, compute an orbit, and based on that orbit, they can predict where the asteroid is going to be in the future at any given time with uncertainty. So obviously, you can imagine trying to fit an orbit through just four data points taking in a few hours and a, uh, a, or a few minutes apart gives you very inaccurate prediction the further out you go into the future. But so with that orbit and with the... the uh, the, the, the rate of motion from these observations, they, can, they, they do give you an idea where the asteroid's going to be, and they give you a rate, uh, a rate in, say, arc, arc seconds per minute, um, and also the sign. And so we, we do get that information. So we just, and the, the SETI telescope has the ability of changing your tracking rate relative to sidereal um, by inputting these values. So that, that, that's how we do it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. So you're actually doing sidereal as well. Obviously, you've got to compensate for that as well. Yeah, so you do sidereal, and then you add a like a, a, a add-on onto that to to get your non-sidereal rate. Yeah. Okay. So you you're essentially tweaking the sidereal rate. So is as these uh, have they got like a direct drive or what? How does it? Oof, I it's got to be a very it. accurate drive. The mechanics of it. Uh, okay, so um, Atlas does not do non-sidereal, right? So they just do they just doing sidereal. So for, for Atlas, um, that's not a problem. Um, Lissetti, uh, it's an alt as telescope, but I'm not really sure what the drive there is. Um, uh, so I can't answer that question. Sorry. Okay. All right. Thanks. You're gonna have to ask someone like Vili or one of the engineers. All right. All right. Anybody else got questions for Nick? Uh, Peter Kotze, yeah. just one question, Nick. Uh, there you go. <laughs> sorry, sorry, oh, Jenny, just give Peter a chance. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. 
what is the absolute lowest limit of detection of your satellite system? What is the smallest size of asteroid you can detect? Uh, it depends on how close it comes. Um, so Atlas with, um, you know, it's limit of 18.5 have detected one meter size objects um, that really, you know, um, some of them have actually hit us. So 20, what's it, 2019 OM, the one that I said that hit over the Caribbean and LA that hit Botswana. Um, again, Atlas did not discover it before it hits us. They um, they had to go back in the images and say, hey, we did see it there. So in principle, they did detect it. And those were sort of one meter, two meter size objects, but they hit us, so they came really close. Um, okay. So it, it really depends on how, how far out. Um, you know, uh, the distance of a moon, um, you know, there you're looking at maybe, uh, yeah, I don't know. And again, it, it depends on the phase angle. Uh, is the sun directly behind you or not? Um, how much light is reflecting? It's, it's, you know, it's a difficult question to answer. <laughs> okay, no, thanks a lot. Sorry, Jenny, did you have a question? Uh, yes, thanks, Derek. Um, Nick, I noticed on the image you had of the characterization with the scale pictures of different asteroids that some of the very small ones had impact craters. And you sort of think, how can an impact, uh, how can something that small in such a huge area of space be hit by an impact, you know, by a meteorite, if you like? Yeah. But so these, these are. These, uh, sorry, Gary. These have been around for 13 billion years. So the chances of them being hit by something are probably quite high. Yeah. So I don't know what the impact rate is, um, but, you know, if it's. Uh, once every million years. And remember, an impact like this, um, this is like very soft stuff. So you don't need a large, this can be like a grain mm -hmm. of sand that causes this. And remember, this is not, um, these are large objects, right? They look small. So even the smallest guy here is half a kilometer in diameter. So these things are way, way bigger than the, the stuff I, um, the near Earth asteroids I was talking about late, yeah. later in the talk. But it just shows how, you know, it's time. The chances of something relatively small in out there in you know in this large area of space is actually quite high. Yeah. Nick, I was just going to ask the um, evasive action that people who are looking at uh, ways of being able to either deflect or destroy uh, threats to to uh, Earth. How do you liaise with them? Um. Yeah, so that's really country to country dependent. Um, so the important thing is that all these asteroid discoveries are immediately made public. Um, so these submissions I was telling you about, so when Atlas discovers an asteroid, they submit it to the Minor Planet Center. The Minor Planet Center has a, a website, which is completely public. Um, I can show that to you right now if you want. Um. <clears throat> So for instance, these are the ones that have been discovered in the past few nights. Um, and so uh, ZTF is another asteroid. Um, PanStars is the one starting with P. This is actually interesting enough for a Namibian observer, this XCOS, so uh, observer in Harcourse, um, Catalina with a C. And so these are immediately made public. So pretty much within an hour of any of these programs, well, at least Pan stars, Catalina, and, and Atlas, the, the, you know, the regular surveys, the, the, the specifically designed for asteroid discovery surveys. Within an hour of a discovery, and most of that time is, um, um, you know, processing the images, but within finding an, an asteroid in the images, I would say within 10 minutes, it will appear on this page. Um, and so that's completely um, public. And then, so then there are other groups like, um, JPL Scout, which is the NASA group, they then scrape all those discoveries. They recompute their orbits. Um, they give impact ratings here. So these are all, for instance, on the list, you're all zero, zero. Um, you see um, if it's one, there's a small chance of impact to the relatively. So as soon as something appears here, we'll say something more than a. So this one year, you, I would take with a grain of salt, there's only been four observations of it. Um, so as soon as you've got more than, you know, uh, say four or five observations from independent people, and this impact rating here goes to, I don't know, two or three, 
then you can you can bet your do bottom dollar that a lot of people are going to be jumping on this. Um, and so then it's really country specific. So the US, they have really, they have all their ducks in a row. They know exactly what they're going to do if they discover something that's going to impact us. Um, they've got a whole chain of command through NASA and all the way to, you know, the president and whatever. Um, but it really, and, and Europe have something similar as well, but it, then it's really, you know, sort of country by country dependent. But then it's going to probably be a few days or maybe a few weeks before um, we really nail down what this thing is that's going to hit us. I mean, I'm talking about something big, and I'm not talking about something that's five or 10 meters that'll probably burn up in the atmosphere. I'm talking about something, you know, bigger than 100 meters in diameter. Maybe we figure out it's going to hit us in a week or two or three weeks. Um, then it's, <laughs> I guess that's going to be an interesting time. What's, what's going to happen? Because it, we're not immediately going to know where it's going to hit us. You know, and so if if the US JPL say, okay, there's a 5% chance it's going to get hit the US, you know, then, you know, they might just say, okay, well, we're going to wait it out. Um, if they already know it's 100% it's going to hit the Pacific Ocean, they might not do anything. If, you know, it really, then it becomes really a political thing. Very and actually, the, the, yeah, sorry, one more last thing. There are um, every two years, there's a planetary defense conference where they simulate this whole, these whole scenarios. Um, and that's not just a US thing, it's a, it's a global thing. All, all astronomers from all over the globe take part in this. And they, they grab one of these guys and they sort of um, simulate one of them going to hit the Earth. And um, through the whole week, they work out all the follow-up observations and they even have a, a, a stream in the conference for the political side how, how they would do that and, you know, it's quite interesting well for my money i really enjoyed this presentation thank you so much pleasure yeah, thanks, thanks very much. Are there any more questions before we wrap up? No, I think I want to echo Sandy's sentiments, and I think that it actually applies to all of us. It was most, most enjoyable, most informative, Nick. Thanks. Thanks for your trouble. It's a pleasure. And please go to uh, Valley's uh, YouTube page and um, watch his uh, videos. He's got a lot of videos on the construction of the telescope and actually he recently uploaded um, videos of uh, an, another new telescope in Southern Prime, Japanese telescope, and he's also recently up all the telescopes. So it's really worthwhile to um, go check out his YouTube channel. Thanks. Yeah, uh, that, uh, learning about that Lafferty uh, telescope is, is it's all very interesting. I'd like to know more about that, but uh, it was all very fascinating. Thanks very much. I greatly enjoyed it, and I'm sure everybody did. All right. Thank you. So, uh, you should try and get uh, uh, Hannah Waters, who's the PI for that telescope, to give a talk on just Lissetti. It's, it's a very nice telescope. Okay. Make a note of that name. Peter, did you hear that? I'll put it in the chat. Thanks very much. Okay. So thanks very much, and it was greatly enjoyable, and thanks very much to Peter for organizing it. All right. If you don't mind, then can we go ahead with our other business, if there are no other questions? Yes, I'm going to run because I have to observe now. Okay, enjoy. Thanks very much. All right. All right. Cheers, everyone. I'll, Bye. I'll send you a link to the recording. I'll upload it to YouTube, if that's okay. Okay. Thank you. All right.